Hello and welcome to this How To Academy event with me, Matt Stadlin. I'm a regular presenter here at How To and I'm a former LBC and BBC presenter and a former Telegraph columnist. It's a great pleasure to share this evening with you. We've got a very special guest, Steve Bidoff, who's joining us all the way from Tassie and Tasmania in, in Australia. When you see him, his eyes are a little bit bloodshot and you might think he's just recovering or still got COVID, but he's not. It's just about 3.30 in the morning and he's woken up especially for you. I, however, did have COVID last week, so I've just recovered. Today was my freedom day and it was jolly nice to be outside. I can strongly recommend it. I'm very pleased that you've chosen to spend this evening with us. And the reason we're here is because we want to talk about a new way of using our, our brain. It's a, a new book by Steve, who I think is the most famous Tasmanian outside of cricketers. So I can think of David Boone as a famous Tasmanian. He used to put England to the sword all the way through my childhood. And I think holds the record, or did hold the record, for the number of tinnies he drank on the flight from Australia to England ahead of an Ashes series. It was something like 60, quite extraordinary. Anyway, this is about how to use our, our brain in positive ways and new ways, perhaps ways that have been around forever, but that we didn't really understand. And Steve says in the book that a five-year-old can understand how to work the brain in the way that he is going to reteach us to do. So it means that people like me are able to take something from it right from the word go. Steve, it's, it's really good to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for joining us at such a crazy time of night. Hello, Matthew. And, and, and hello to everyone who's watching. It's brilliant to have this bit of time with you. I want to start, if I, if I may, with the end of your book, as you direct us right at the start. You say you're too shy to say a little bit about the author at the start. So you, you then direct us to the end. Should we be interested in who it is who's going to be talking to us for the next 280 pages or so? And it is quite relevant and important because your own personal story perhaps partly explains why you wrote the book. Yes, um, yes, that's... Um... That's true, Matthew. What would you like to ask about that? Well, just your, your experience of mental health yourself and the condition, yes. that, you, the condition that, you, that you ascribe to yourself and, and the realisation at a particular point in your life that, that you were living with that condition and the sort of impact it's broadly had on you. And perhaps also, okay. perhaps also whether it's sort of informed your understanding of other people's struggles or experiences. That's a yes, I, I understand that that's a and that's a um, really important for people to know. I I have a um, a condition which everyone knows about now, but when I was a little boy running around the the beaches of Yorkshire, uh, nobody had heard of. Um, it's and it's called Asperger's syndrome. And um, when you're a little boy, it doesn't matter much because little boys just run about and do stuff and. Um, but when you're a teenager, it's it's a really big deal because the way it mostly manifested for me was I could see people having these things called conversations, um, and they looked like fun. And especially if girls were involved, they looked really great. And I couldn't work out how to do them. Um, I couldn't work out how a conversation was meant to go. And and I'd I I was I'd keep trying and. Um, it just never worked out. And so it was lucky. To, two things were really lucky. One, I became a psychologist and the training really helped. Um, the other was I married Sharon, who was a very warm hearted, but very emotionally intelligent kind of woman. And, um, and people on the autism spectrum, we know, do quite well if they marry someone who's very good hearted. And um, so I gradually learned how to fit in and and in fact sort of jumped normal um when you when you have to pay attention to everything that comes out of your mouth and you have to keep watching people's faces to see what they're feeling it's not such a bad thing there's, a, there's plenty of people could probably benefit from doing that um so i can sit stand in front of an audience of a thousand people and pretty much know where everyone in the room is at and and so I kind of jumped normal, and um, and it's so I don't want people to feel sorry for me. It's it's been it's been a blast. <laughs> I'm I'm 68 now, and um, I still get very anxious. 
socially, um, a lot of situations I can't manage that well, but but it's 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 help, helped me to write simple books because I had to explain things to myself. And so my books are very simple. I know you have a lot of very intellectual people on, on this, this program. And so I need to let you know right from the start, I'm not, not one of those, um, but I've, my talent is to put things simply. D does that all make sense, Matthew? Yeah, I think it's fascinating that you managed to combine in yourself shyness and, and certain, in certain circumstances, social anxiety with this capacity to stand in front of a thousand people and captivate an audience. And, if, if we were not in the times that we are at the moment, we might very well be on stage. You might be on tour of, of the UK. And, and we mm. both love that, I think, because I love being on stage and yet I suffer from anxiety, not performance anxiety, actually, other forms of anxiety. And also occasionally social anxiety. I might find it very awkward or difficult to be in a, in a drinks party, for example. And yet I can stand in front of all these people and perform and enjoy it and be in, in the moment. One of the things that I'm curious about in your answer there, Steve, was that you said you can kind of know where everyone in that room of a thousand is at. What did you mean by that? Do you mean you, you, you have a special ability to kind of see a thousand people at the same time and grasp their presence? Or do you mean you kind of understand how they're feeling? It's a, it's a, a very specific thing, Matthew. What I do is I work with the, the, the venue, the production staff to get the lighting of the room so that I can see every face. And, um, and I start to, um, to, to go after everyone and, and find the people who look a bit lost and a bit unsure and just um, connect with them. And I learned family therapy from a woman called Virginia Satia, who was probably the best human being ever on the planet at connecting with people. And, um, and she just wouldn't let you go um, unnoticed. Um, and, um, so I'm not exactly sure how it works. I, I this, that's what I tell myself is happening, but, but it's like, you just care about everyone in the room and you, and you want to make sure they're, uh, they're with the program and that you're not going too fast or, um, upsetting them too much. People used to break into tears in my talks it was an unusual things, men, particularly with the, the raising boys talk would sometimes leave the theater. And I talked to the ushers afterwards and there was one British talk. I, I talked to the ushers who were in a theater. Um, and they said, I said, a couple of guys left, you know, were they just taking calls? Or they said, no, they were crying. Um, and it was the content. It, it was the stories about men and our fathers. And so we made the talk, you know, I studied people like Billy Connolly and Garrison Keeler and people, and we just had to lighten it up. So we made sure people were laughing. They might have been crying, but they were laughing too. Um, because you want to touch people, but you want them to stay for the whole time. And it's a terrible, um, terrible outcome if people can't, man you know, are too upset to stay in the room. Um, so I became a kind of stand-up psychologist in the end. And uh, the, the shows are as hilarious as they are. Um, hopefully in, informative now um, yes but this is this is stuff I haven't thought about for a while so I, yes um. there's a very important part of this book where you talk about trauma and the trauma that we all need to heal and you address the question of why there is so much trauma around and one of the things you say that for you as a therapist it's important to kind of match the trauma of people's experiences essentially with the love that you emit as a therapist explain that for us yes yes well for a, about 15 years i i taught i taught therapists and um and l what we learned a lot from our trainees because as as we, we the way we worked wasn't about powerpoints and and lists and lectures we would sit in a room and we would we would work on things through working on ourselves and and just accidentally in the course of that we discovered in the early on that in a room of 16 people who were training together for perhaps six months um it got pretty close and that probably two-thirds of the people in the room certainly if the women had been sexually abused or had a sexual assault in their background and that it was incredibly um widespread and this was when the psychology world was just waking up to how widespread this was in in families and children um 
and that we didn't know what to do but we talk, we were all therapists so we're talking about about this and and it was just really clear that if if, a, if it was a circle of people around someone who was talking about this horrific time they had as a child it was the intensity of caring in the room that seemed to buoy them up and and hold them and we realized that you can't get this by going to a, a psychologist who works from a manual and just runs you through a routine um the intensity with which you are harmed has to be matched by the intensity with which you are cared for if that makes sense matthew and 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 it, it it's that as a therapist you have to really 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 be, be focused and not give up and and not shut down your own emotions um the whole training of, of professionals is wrong, I think, in this way, that, that there's a, quite an emphasis on you know, don't get involved, or, which there's some good side to that. But um, if, if you're with someone, for them to be able to go into the deep spaces of emotions that they have never felt safe to feel, their right hemisphere of their brain is reading your face and it knows if you're for real. This is what we part of what we write about in the book there's a part of us that knows and it knows is the person pretending to care or or do they really care are they pretending to pay attention or are they actually freaking out you know with what we're saying um are they on the journey with us or, or not um and if a person's right hemisphere sense of us is that we we're, we're with them um perhaps in a way that their mother or father could never have been with them with these particular feelings, this anger or this, this grief, um, then it, it conveys what they should have got as a little child, which is the capacity to feel the full range. Every, everyone has a, a spectrum of allowed emotion that they brought from childhood. Um, I see you nodding to this, uh, but I need to check is because I'm, saying an awful lot in a short time does does that concept make sense um, am i answering the question there if i wandered off too much well no it, it begs two further and interesting questions i think one about emotions mm. the impact that they have mm. on our lives as you address and how we channel emotions positively or effectively so that's that's a really important follow-up and then i think to delve a little bit more deeply into this idea of the impact of early childhood but perhaps we could start with emotion. Emotion is a word that is common to all of us, but we're not all aware of the effect that emotions have on the way that we understand ourselves, the way that we behave towards others. We can act emotionally through reaction in ways mm. that can be destructive. Mm. If we don't properly understand our own emotions. So perhaps you could talk a little bit about emotion and how they fit into better understanding and using our minds yes yes let me um give, give an, a, a, we'll set out a really clear understanding of emotions to begin with and then i can talk more personally about it to illustrate it for people that um really really simple you're you're driving to work in the morning in your car um and your brain is probably way off with the, with the, off with the birds somewhere because you drive that same journey every day and all of a sudden someone in a, a very fast car suddenly swerves into your lane maybe it's a stolen car or something's going incredibly fast and it's coming straight for you you're suddenly very present and aware and the, the car looks like it's going to hit you and then it just misses by inches and skids and screams off into the distance and you're in traffic there's nothing much you can do except grasp the wheel again and just keep going to work but you're not the same person you were 30 seconds earlier you're quivering with emotion when you get to work you probably can't hold a coffee cup without sloshing it around now the reason for that is a whole heap of emotions have come jumped up inside you fear adrenaline would have rushed into your body and it did that in order to help you um you you might have been in a car wreck and you might have had to 
bust your way out of the windshield to get or from a, perhaps a burning car to safety, you really needed fear in your system. Um, it might have been a couple of idiot kids who got out of their car having nearly killed you and just laughed in your face and you would have been furious with them, You've given them some serious um, parental <laughs> intervention. Um, or it could have gone much worse. Um, you could have died or you, there might have been pedestrians that you'd swerved into who'd been, been killed. And so part of you might have been aware of you know, I could have lost my life. My family could have been without me a few seconds ago. So sadness is, is there. Now, all those emotions have a job to do. They're there to help you. Um, and, but they've gone nowhere. You know, you're at work and you like you've been struck by lightning. And unless, hopefully there'll be people at work who'll sit you down and you'll tell them about what happened. You know, when you get home, hopefully some, someone who loves you will want to hear the whole story and you can shake and cry and, and let it all out of your system. If it doesn't, that doesn't happen, it stays in your system and it becomes what everyone knows is post-traumatic stress. Post-traumatic stress is just held over emotions that you didn't have time or permission to release. And, and so it's, it's stored, stored in your muscles, stored in your organs. Um, but the four feelings I mentioned, sorrow, anger, fear, and the fourth, of course, is joy, happiness. Um, they each have a very simple job to carry us through a situation. When they do that job, they're completely um, self-limiting. We go back to home back to stasis again. Um, in fact, you're, after that experience, you're, you're more alive. You're more aware of your mortality. You're more joyful to be alive if things go well. You've imp the experience has improved you. Uh, it's opened your heart in, in hell, if, if you like. And um, so the, the feelings are very simple. They're a very simple compass and a very simple energy source for a specific, you know, fundamental human situations um and it just as as a british culture which you're you i know matthew have a reading about you you come from the very heart of of a, a british masculinity in the 20th century so messed up um in the sort of emotional expression we we tried to run a civilization where men in particular were cannon fodder we were meant to be cannon fodder and that was what we based the masculinity on for a couple of hundred years it was an interesting experiment um, and did enormous damage um, from a mental health point of view um, and luckily um, your generation you're a generation younger than me um, really emerging from that and running their lives very differently to that um, yeah uh, i must ask you though how we how we use those, how we acknowledge and use and process those emotions so that they don't then lead us astray or are suppressed in a way that might, yes. that might amount to post-traumatic stress disorder later okay. on. All right. 